Today we're going to look at a really interesting integral that involves an inverse hyperbolic trig function as well as just a regular inverse trig function. And we're going to see how they play off of each other. I think it's a pretty nice integral. And we're going to use some results that we've developed in previous videos. The first is the power series expansion of the arc sine of x squared. And it involves these nice double factorials. So if you recall, a double factorial is a descending product where you skip one. So six double factorial is six times four times two. And then there's a similar formula for odd numbers as well. And then we're also going to use something about the beta function. So we proved that when we were working with the gamma function. So beta of zw is defined as the following integral, which is also equal to gamma z gamma w over gamma of z plus w. Furthermore, we're going to use one more identity which relates a hyperbolic trig function or the inverse hyperbolic trig function with the regular inverse uh, trig function. And that's going to be this down here. So we'll start by showing that the inverse hyperbolic sine is equal to minus i times the inverse sine evaluated at i x. Okay, so let's get to that. So let's set y equal to, well, this left-hand side. So it's going to be the arc hyperbolic sine of x. And in other words, the inverse hyperbolic sine. But let's notice by function inverse function relationship, that tells us that x is equal to the hyperbolic sine of y. There's really not much to that. But let's recall what the hyperbolic sine is. The hyperbolic sine is e to the y minus e to the minus y all over two. Okay, great. But now let's see if we can get maybe an i times x into this situation because notice we have an i times x over here. So we wanna somehow fuse x with the imaginary unit i. So we'll do that by taking this equation right here and multiplying by i, which is the same thing as dividing by um, negative i. In other words, multiplying by negative one over i. So I think that's pretty clear. Okay, so what is that gonna leave us with? So we'll have i times x is the same thing as e to the minus y minus e to the y all over 2i, where I change the order of subtraction because of this minus sign right here. Okay, but now we're going to write these exponents of the exponentials on the right hand side in kind of a tricky way. So I'm going to take this first one and write it as e to the i times i times y. So that works because i squares to negative one. And then we'll have minus e to the minus i times i times y. Again, that works because i squares to minus one. But let's observe that this right-hand side is now just the normal uh, trig function sine. So if we look at this right here and think about this as being our angle theta, then it's kind of well known via Euler's formula or maybe via an inverse version of Euler's formula that this is equal to the sine of theta. So in other words, what we have here is i times x is equal to, well, let's see, that's gonna be sine of i times y. But now from here, we'll just take the inverse sine of both sides. That's going to give us the inverse sine, in other words, the arc sine of ix is equal to i times y. But now we can divide by i, which is the same thing as multiplying by negative i to put a negative i over here and thus get exactly this last tool. Okay, so now that we've got all of our little tools, we'll start to work with our goal integral. Okay, so let's look at our integral.
we've got the integral from zero to one of the inverse hyperbolic sine function. Oh, notice I've got an extra h in there times the inverse cosine function over the square root of x squared plus one. Okay, so we're gonna start this with a round of integration by parts. And so that means we need to choose something to play the role of u and then choose something to play the role of d if we're using the standard notation for integration by parts. And here we're gonna take u to be the arc cosine of x and then what does that mean? So that means that du is equal to, well, we've got to remember what the derivative of the inverse cosine is. But if you look that up, that's going to be minus dx over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we won't go through that. That's a well-known identity. And then we'll take dv to be the rest. So that'll be our inverse hyperbolic sine function all over the square root of x squared plus one dx. And this seems like kind of gnarly, but what's great about this is, well, the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic sine function is one over square root of x squared plus one. So via a substitution, it's pretty easy to take the antiderivative of this and we'll get our v function as one half times the arc hyperbolic sine of x all squared. So now if you look at this by the chain rule, if you take the derivative of v, you get exactly what we have over here, and that's what makes this whole thing work. Okay, so we've got our integration by parts set up, and let's recall that now this will turn into u times v. So let's write this as one half, we have arc cosine of x times the hyperbolic sine inverse of x squared evaluated from zero to one. So that's like our u times v minus the integral of v du. So let's see, v du, but it's attached to a minus sign. So those two minus signs cancel and that's gonna give us plus the integral from zero to one, we'll have a half that comes out from this half right here, and then we'll have this inverse hyperbolic sine squared over root x squared plus one. So there's kind of a lot going on there still, but at least we've hopefully simplified it a little bit. Okay, so now let's do this evaluation. So we need to take the inverse cosine evaluated at one. Well, given the domain of the inverse cosine, that'll give us zero. That's because cosine of zero is one. And then, well, we need to plug zero in as well, but the inverse hyperbolic sine evaluated at zero is also zero. So this becomes zero, well, kind of for two different reasons or because of the two different functions that we see here. Oh, and I just realized that this should have been not x squared plus one like it was originally. That was gobbled up in our integration by parts. It should be one minus x squared. So now that's looking a little better. And now we'll replace our inverse hyperbolic sign with just the regular inverse sign using this formula over here. But since they're both squared and we've got this with an i on it, the i will square out to negative one and that's gonna turn this plus half to a minus half. Okay, so let's see what we've got. So now this is gonna give us minus half. We have the integral from zero to one of the regular arc sine evaluated i x all squared over the square root of one minus x squared dx. Okay, great. And now we're gonna take this arc sine of ix and replace it with a power series using this over here. But let's notice we've only got even powers of x and that's really good news because those even powers of x will maybe take this value of i and turn it into plus or minus one depending on if those numbers are two mod four or zero mod four. In other words, they have a remainder of two when dividing by four or zero when dividing by four. So we'll maybe like just jump to having the following formula. So we'll have one half 
and then we'll have the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of minus one to the n, and then we have two n double factorial over two n plus one double factorial, and then we'll have an n plus one, and then the integral from zero up to one of x to the two n plus two over the square root of one minus x squared dx. Okay, so this minus one to the n came again from taking i to the power two n plus two and combining with the minus sign that's happening right there. Okay, now we're gonna sneak in a substitution for this integral. Okay, so let's maybe put it here in the purple box. And that substitution will be to take x squared and set it equal to t. Okay, but now notice if we do that, we'll get dx is equal to one over two times t to the half dt. Okay, great. And then, well, let's take this purple integral and just write that down here under this substitution, not worrying about the rest of it for just this moment. And that'll give us the integral from zero to one because the bounds of integration won't change. And then we'll have another value of one half because of this dx term. And then we'll end up with t to the n plus one half. So let's see, that'll come from this numerator right here. And then we'll have one minus t to the minus one half dt. That comes from this denominator. But let's look at this. This is exactly one of these beta functions that we see over here. In fact, this is beta of, let's see, it's gonna be n plus three halves comma one half. So again, that's just by the definition of this beta function. Notice we've got t to the z minus one and one minus t to the w minus one, and that's what we have over here. But now in terms of the gamma function, that's gonna be gamma of n plus three halves, and then gamma of one half all over gamma of n plus, well, the sum of those two, which will give us n plus two. Okay, so let's maybe summarize that at the top of the next board and then we'll keep going. Okay, so this is where we are at the moment. And now we're gonna take these gamma functions and uh, replace them with things that are a little bit more well known. So probably easiest is this gamma of n plus two, which is n plus one factorial. And then furthermore, these gamma functions of half integer powers also have, you know, fairly well-known values uh, using the square root of pi. And that comes from the Gaussian integral. So I'll let you look that up if you need to, or just write down these via the definition of the gamma function and do a couple of changes of variables, and you'll see where that comes from. And so in fact, what we get here is, let's see, pi times 2n plus one factorial all over, let's see, four times two to the two n. Okay, great. Oh, and then we also have another n factorial. Okay, so now we're gonna put those in to this sum. And that's gonna leave us with the following object. So let's see, this is gonna be equal to pi over eight. So from that pi, and then we'll have the sum as n goes from zero to infinity, we'll have minus one to the n. We still have this two n double factorial, but now we'll have a two n plus one, just normal factorial. And then this will be all over, let's see, a two n plus one double factorial and then a two to the two n, and then an n plus one, and then an n factorial. Oh, and another n plus one factorial from this. Okay, great. So a lot is going on there for sure. Now, next up we're gonna use an identity which is um, maybe kind of surprising to look at, but after you like look at the details, it comes together pretty quickly, and that is 
2 to the n times n factorial is equal to 2n double factorial. You can really see that just by taking the n factorial and multiplying every term that you see there by 2. Okay, so let's see what that'll do for us. So we can take this 2 to the 2n and split it over this n factorial and the n factorial that we can get out of this. This is an n plus 1 times an n factorial. So let's see, in the end, we'll have pi over 8, and then the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity. So we'll have a minus 1 to the n. The numerator is not going to change any just yet. So 2n double factorial, and then 2n plus 1 single factorial. And then we'll have this 2n plus 1 double factorial. And then I'm going to form our first 2n double factorial from taking this and splitting it into 2 to the n times 2 to the n, and then combining one of these 2 to the n's with this n factorial, using that over there like we said before. So 2n double factorial. And then we're going to get another one from combining this 2n with this n factorial. So I'm just going to write that again. So 2n double factorial once again. And then I'll take this n plus 1 and this n plus 1, combine them together into an n plus 1 squared. And now let's start simplifying. So let's see, this 2n double factorial cancel this 2n double factorial. And then we can fuse this 2n plus 1 double factorial, this 2n double factorial, into a 2n plus 1 single factorial. So this is hitting all the odd numbers as it does the descending product. This is hitting all of the even numbers. So if you multiply them together, you get all of the numbers in your descending product. So anyway, those two combine together to cancel this. And then let's see what we have. We have pi over 8, and then we have the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity minus 1 to the n over n plus 1 quantity squared. But that's some sort of alternating version of, well, the famous Basel problem. And we've derived the value of that on the channel before. It has the value of pi squared over 12. So multiplying pi squared over 12 together with pi over 8 gives us pi cubed over 96. And so there we have it. The value of our crazy integral over here comes to be something pretty nice, like this pi cubed over 96. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.